My name is Melissa Clem and I am with the Homestead team of Hagen Realty. Um, I've been a real estate agent for the better part of seven years. Uh, before that I was in uh, corporate America in the nonprofit world, so, um, but I am a horse owner and a horse farm owner myself. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my team and then we're going to move into the process of buying equestrian property. Um, if you have questions while I'm talking, feel free to let me know, raise your hand, um, or if you'd rather, you can also save your questions for the end, whatever you feel is, is the best way. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just had a quick question. Does sure. This, does this sort of broadly apply to like any state or is this going to be very specific to like the state of Pennsylvania buying farms? Sure. So um, her question in the front, in case you can't hear, she wanted to know if this applied uh, mostly to Pennsylvania um, or if we are able to apply it more broadly to other states. So it'll apply to other states as well. Um, my team is licensed actually in four states currently, about to be five. Um, so not just Pennsylvania specific, but um, we're licensed in Pennsylvania. So if you have PA specific questions, we can answer those too. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, as I mentioned, I got into real estate about seven years ago. Um, horse properties are a specialty of ours. Um, we also sell residential homes. A lot of our clients have a neighborhood home that they're selling to be able to afford to purchase the equestrian dream farm. But um, I got into it because uh, seven years ago, or actually, gosh, now it's almost 10 years ago, when we bought our farm, my family's personal farm, um, we couldn't find an agent that truly understood them. Um, you know, we'd go out with our realtor, we'd look at properties and they'd say, oh, Melissa, it's got a beautiful house and it's on 10 acres and it's exactly in the area that you guys want to be in, it's in your price range. And I'd say, that sounds amazing. And we'd get there and it would be 10 acres on the side of a mountain and fully wooded. I'm like, this is never going to be a horse farm, never. Um, so we got into it because we thought, you know what, there's really a need for equestrians who own farms, who have horses, to help sell real estate. Um, and it's been really successful because I think that, you know, I don't know if you've all been looking at all at some of the farm ads that other agents write. Sometimes you can tell just by reading the ad that they don't really understand farms. Um, and sometimes you can tell if there aren't even sufficient photos of the horse amenities that, you know, in that moment you realize really, really need to have an agent with you that understands farms and equestrian properties. Um, so I think there was a video. Did you play the video, Judd? And I won't play the whole thing, but this just shows some of the farms that we helped um, our clients buy and sell last year in 2021. We had about 60 transactions. Um, and we're licensed in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, uh, Washington, D.C. Now, there aren't really any horse farms in Washington, D.C., but we have clients that sell residential property there uh, sometimes to buy farms. Um, and we're getting our licenses in uh, West Virginia as well. Um, and if you have uh, an interest in buying farms in other states, um, I also have a network of equestrian realtors in other parts of the country. Um, and that's something I can talk to you about as well as part of my chat here today, how to interview a realtor, which is something you don't usually hear about. Um, so these are some of the properties that we sold this year. Um, this one's actually uh, up in Gettysburg uh, coming up. And then we've got some others here in Maryland um, as well that we've sold. So I'm gonna skip ahead. There we go. Um, so a little bit about us. We had 60 sales last year in 2021. Um, we have a very high success rate for selling equestrian properties. Um, even before the housing market started to explode, you know, the last two years, things have been a little crazy. Um, you know, five star reviews on Zillow. A lot of our sales come from people who are casually looking. Um, I talk about farm buyers as being a little more passive sometimes only because there are not a lot of farms on the market at any given time. So sometimes, you know, looking every week in Zillow, you're not going to find the volume and the, and the number of farms that you're looking for. So having an agent who really is connected to the community, to the horse community, and knows when things are coming up is really important. Um, we have a team-based approach um, at my brokerage. So we work with, um, I have eight agents on my team, um, and we work very closely with uh, digital marketing experts and a transaction coordinator and an attorney. Um, and we have a full suite of digital technology that we use when we market homes. And that's true for equestrian properties and residential properties. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been riding since I was little. Um, grew up working on horse farms in high school and college. Bought my own farm in 2014, about eight years ago. Uh, 15 years of experience um, outside of real estate in the corporate marketing world. Um, and I specialize in farmettes and professional facilities. I've sold everything from you know, a three acre farmette that you could keep two horses on to I think the largest property our team sold this year was 120 acres. 
So enough about me and my team. I want to talk to you today about buying the dream farm. And I say buying the dream farm because everybody's dreams can be a little bit different. But I think when we talk about buying a horse farm, the first thing we should do is really prioritize your wish list. And this is usually the first conversation that I have with somebody when they call and say, Melissa, I'm looking for a horse farm. I say, okay, tell me what you're looking for. Tell me how many horses you plan to keep there. Now I see a few folks in the audience here that look like they might be supportive spouses. Um, this is the part where I want you to cover your ears. Your wives aren't gonna wanna hear this part. Um, when I say, how many horses do you have? The next question I ask is how many horses do you plan to have? Because that's gonna be really important for when we're looking at property. So your wish list, when you're talking about what farm you're gonna buy, is gonna start with usually location, right? You know that you wanna be in Maryland or Pennsylvania, Virginia, maybe you're looking in New Jersey. Um, the next thing you wanna talk about though is how many horses you plan to keep at the farm. Because this is really gonna drive how many acres you need. And when I say acres, I mean usable pasture land, right? So in some counties, they have a rule, like Montgomery County, Maryland, they have a lot of rules there, about how many horses you can have per acre, okay? And they do enforce those rules, so you can't just decide, I bought five acres, I'm gonna keep eight horses on it. They're gonna shut you down on that. Other counties are a little bit less restrictive, but regardless of what the county rules are, you've gotta keep in mind that, of course, we all know hay prices are going up, right? Cost of diesel is going up, cost of fertilizer is going up, cost of baling twine even is going up because that's a petroleum product. So having adequate pasture is going to be really, really important going forward, okay? Also, a lot of people like to turn their horses out. I turn my horses out. Um, we don't want to turn them out in a mud pit. So too many horses per acre is a real problem. So the rule of thumb that I tell my clients to keep in mind, you want two acres of pasture for the first horse and an acre of pasture for each additional horse that you plan to have. So let's say you currently have two horses, you plan to have as many as four, okay? Um, you're gonna wanna have five acres of pasture. Now that's separate from how many acres you're buying, okay? I see farms all the time and they're advertised as 12 acre farmette. Well, that's great, but if seven acres are woods, you're not gonna be able to turn your horses out in the woods. You need five acres of usable pasture to have four horses so that you have the option of proper pasture maintenance, okay, they're USDA, uh, is one of the booths right next to ours, and they're talking to people about proper um, seeding and liming and taking care of your fields, rotation of um, your pastures. So it's really important that you consider how many total acres of pasture you're gonna need. The next thing you're gonna wanna think about is what kind of horse keeping are you gonna do? Do you need trail access? Do you want a barn? What kind of barn do you want? Are you planning to turn your horses out all the time? Is it better to have more run-in sheds? Are you running a professional facility where Maybe your clients are going to want to have an indoor and they're going to expect their horses to be in a fancier barn most of the time. So that's really something that's important to add to your list. Now if you'll notice, we've talked about acres, location, pasture. What we haven't talked about yet is, um, we've talked about barns, what we haven't talked about yet is the house. Usually when I talk with folks that are looking for a farm, the first thing they say is, you know, that's the list. And I have to say, well, how many, uh, what, what about the house? right? So make sure that you keep in mind, are you willing to look at um, a house that needs cosmetic updates? A lot of times when you look at equestrian properties, you're going to find that either the barn is amazing and it has an amazing pasture, really good fencing and a great ring, but then the house might need some cosmetic updating. Now it doesn't mean that you should say no to it, but it means we might have to factor in some budget for that, right? Or you might look and maybe it's a really old house and it has an older stone foundation and a dirt basement we're gonna to have to factor in what kind of inspections we're gonna do. So keep in mind what kind of house you're comfortable with. I'll be honest, a lot of times folks will tell me all the things they want for the horses, and then when I ask about the house, they say, well, it just has to be livable, okay? Well, tell me what livable is for you, because that can mean different things to different people. Okay, so make your list. The reason I say this, it, yes, it's fun to dream, but what's really important is when you start looking at farms, they're each going to be very different. So you wanna make sure the top three or four things on your list, those are the items that we're not gonna want you to compromise on, okay? So if you know you really need acreage, you need a specific location, and there's a style of a barn you need, let's not get distracted when we walk into a house that has a really cool kitchen, because that might not be a top priority for you, but it's easy when you're walking through to get distracted by that sort of thing. Okay, your search. 
let's talk about this part. So we know what you're looking for now. Your search process here. Oh, I'm gonna let them keep going. <laughs> okay, sorry. So when you start your search, it's gonna be really important that you have an equestrian agent to help you. Here's why. It is very easy to go on Zillow and to go on Realtor.com and some of these other websites and look for property. Here's the problem with that though. Those websites only update once every 24 hours. So in this market that we're in where things are flying very quickly on and off the market, you don't wanna wait until something is, shows up on Zillow as for sale because honestly at that point it might already have contracts on it. So what, it's really important that you work with an equestrian agent because we can see the multiple list service, we can see what is for sale currently, we can see what is coming up, and we can proactively, a really good agent, and I'm gonna to talk to you about this, uh, how to screen an agent next. A really good agent should be able to look at a property and tell you yes or no, does it have the kind of equestrian amenities that you're looking for? I can tell when I look at a farm, in the MLS, does it have too much wooded acreage? I can look at the um, map of the property and see how much pasture land is really available. Are we looking at like half of it being pasture, half of it being wooded? Um, sometimes the agents who are listing the farm, if they don't know equestrian properties really well, they won't have really good photos of the barn or the arena. That's okay, they won't be able to answer questions ahead of time. A good equestrian agent though should be able to call and talk that agent through it, right? Can you tell me how big the barn is? Can you tell me what kind of arena it has? If they don't know, that's okay. They can go ask their seller, right? Um, so these are the kind of things that a really good agent should be able to do for you. Now, I would love for all of you to work with me and my team at Hagen Realty, but if you're thinking that maybe you wanna look outside of where we are, that's okay. I'm gonna tell you what to ask when you call a realtor and ask them to help you find an equestrian property. First question, how many farms did you help somebody buy last year? If the answer is one or two, you might not be working with somebody who is a serious equestrian realtor. Second question you should ask them, do they own horses? Okay. Being able to understand equestrian property means that you understand how to take care of the horses because we're not just looking at farms in May when it's 70 degrees and sunny, everything looks freshly mowed, everything looks easy to take care of. We wanna think about when we're evaluating farms, how easy is it gonna to be to keep a horse here in February when it's four degrees outside, 20 mile an hour winds, and the water hose is frozen, right? Ask them how many farms they have sold. Okay, how many buyers did they work with? How many did they actually sell that were equestrian properties? And do they own a farm? Okay, there are plenty of really good realtors out there that don't own farms, don't own horses, and that's great, but they're not equestrian realtors, okay? And when you're making a, an investment of this size, you're probably not gonna buy another farm next year, right? You're gonna do this, it's gonna be probably for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So you wanna make sure that you make a really good decision. An agent who buys and sells farms with her clients all the time or his clients all the time will also understand zoning. They'll understand conservation easements. They'll understand uh, deed restrictions like covenants that might say, even though this is a 10 acre property with a beautiful house, the deed says you cannot keep horses here. We don't wanna find that out when you get to the closing table and you're signing the deed, okay? So make sure that you have an agent who understands those things. Okay, so you found an agent, you have your priority list, you understand what you're looking for, you found a list of farms that you wanna go check out and you've made appointments. How do you evaluate a farm when you're there in person? This is really important. Now, I am not a home inspector or an engineer. Those are important people to have um, connections with and your agent should have connections with those. But I'm gonna to talk to you about some things that you as a buyer and an agent, whoever your agent is, should be able to see when you're walking through looking at these properties. First thing we're gonna look at. Now, if you've ever bought and sold a house, does anybody here own a house, like a residential house? Probably the first thing you did when you got there was you went in the house, right? When you look at a farm, the first thing you do, usually, is not go in the house, okay? I always have to tell my sellers this, you know, when they have a farm on the market, because they get very concerned when people show up and they don't go right in the house. Most farm buyers, and this is true of 95% of my clients, when we get to a farm, first place they wanna go is in the barn, okay? And that's because that's where your dream starts, right? You imagine going out into the barn and feeding your horses and grooming them and getting them tacked up, listening to them munch hay, maybe you dream about taking care of them in the morning and feeding them breakfast in your pajama pants, okay? 
we want to make sure that the barn matches the purpose that you had set up for the horses, right? So if your mind, if your vision for how you're taking care of the horses involves, you know, stalls and a tack room, you need a wash stall, maybe you've got show horses, we want to make sure that that matches with the barn layout and design that we see. Now, sometimes we'll find barns that are turnkey, they're beautiful, you know, we've got some really cool barn builders here, and it's easy, right? We walk in, there's matted stalls, they're airy, there's good ventilation, there's an obvious tack room, but sometimes we'll find a property with acreage in the location that you want, really good pasture, good fencing, nice house, and it has a barn that needs some work. So this is where, again, having a good agent is helpful because I, when I go to a farm appointment, bring a few things with me. Um, one of them is a walking tape. It's a measuring tape that's designed to measure larger spaces. You're gonna wanna be able to measure that barn. If it's not already set up for horses, we need to figure out pretty quickly, can it accommodate 12 by 12 stalls or 10 by 10 stalls, whatever your preference is? Is there room for the tack and the feed and the hay storage? Okay, I've had many clients where we've found farms and maybe it's a dairy barn. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in like a milking parlor. Those can become horse barns. Costs a little money, takes a little creativity, but we wanna make sure to evaluate that barn ceiling height. Is that gonna work for your horses? Is there space to store hay? Where are you gonna store bedding? Okay, can we fix, you know, if it's a milking parlor, maybe the concrete's a little bit uneven. Can you make that level? Okay, it's all possible, but we also have to keep in mind your budget. Right? If that barn is at the top of your budget, that farm rather, do we have the money there then to adjust the barn and to kind of redesign it? And that's where it's really important to look at current layout, current features. Um, the other thing we want to look at when we're in a barn, this is really important. I was actually talking to somebody earlier today, they had the fire department out to make sure that their barn was safe. The number one cause of barn fires is bad electrical. Okay. Now, I'm not an electrician, most real estate agents are not. But you want to look for things like frayed wires, extension cords everywhere. All of the wires in the barn should be in metal conduit, okay? They should not be easily chewed, easily frayed. So look and see also, um, most barns will have their own electrical juncture box, a panel box. Make sure that's not rusted. You're going to want to look up, okay? Check the roof. Do you see any signs of water staining in the roof? You're going to want to also check and see if there's any signs of termite damage, okay, in the beams. And you're also going to want to look and see, I always say the best time to look at a farm is in the pouring rain, okay? Um, because you're going to want to see how water moves around the barn. Okay, does the barn sit at the bottom of a hill? You might laugh, but I have seen beautiful barns that are built, I don't know why, at the bottom of a hill, okay? That means the water's going to travel down the hill. Does it have a swale or a French drain to move the water away? You don't want to buy it, spend all this money, move in and then realize, the barn floods, okay? So one thing I do with my clients, if we're looking at a property and we have any question about how water moves on that property, we go look at it in the rain, or I go look at it in the rain or right after a rain, okay? So you wanna evaluate the barn. You also wanna evaluate the arena. Now, not everybody needs an arena, right? Some folks just wanna trail ride, maybe they do endurance, they don't need a ring. If you need a ring, you can certainly have one put in. But let's say that you're looking for a property that already has one, okay? A good arena should be, listen, this is important, should be graded at one to one and a half percent. It should have at least a six inch bluestone base, two to three inches of footing on top. It can be a sand, it can be a mix, there's all kinds of fancy footing options. But you wanna make sure that it is designed so that it will drain correctly, okay? And this is especially important if you're buying a farm that doesn't have an indoor, and you're buying it in a climate where it's gonna freeze. Okay, at a certain point, below 25 degrees, it's really hard to keep footing from freezing, but if it holds water, it's gonna freeze much faster. Okay, and that's much harder. And if you're looking at an arena that didn't have a proper base put in, doesn't mean you can't fix it, but having a new arena put in is gonna cost about the same as getting the base fixed sometimes, depending on what they had done. So, you know, if there's no arena, or we're looking at a major repair, you're probably looking at Thirty to forty thousand dollars in some cases. Okay, now if you know a friend who's really good with a skid steer, maybe you save some money. But I would highly encourage you if you're having an arena put in to make sure that you work with a professional arena installer because I've seen them done um, in a way where they need to be, you know, redone. Okay, fencing this is the next thing we're going to evaluate. 
you want to make sure that the fencing is there is safe for horses, right? Sometimes we look at farms and they were originally meant for cattle, okay, and then they're barbed wire, we gotta take that down. You wanna know if the fencing is safe because you're gonna wanna factor in the cost of replacing it if you need to. Um, where I live in Maryland, uh, board fence, three board fence is right now being sold at about hmm, nine to ten dollars a square foot installed. Okay, that's per linear foot rather, not square foot. Nine to ten dollars per linear foot. Um, same price roughly for no climb, which is that middle picture. Um, the one all the way on the right, uh, some people are comfortable with that for their horses. That's a little bit less expensive. If you're looking at something like a ram fence product, which is like the vinyl, it's supposed to be super safe for the horses, that's usually more like $14 to $15 a linear foot. So we need to know, are the posts good, right? Are the posts wiggly? Do they have rot? Do you need to replace all the fencing or just some of the fencing? Okay, the next thing we're going to look at, property layout. Okay, this is really important because it could have a beautiful barn, a beautiful house, but you've got to think about, again, your purpose for the property and also how you're going to care for the horses. So I had clients recently who found a beautiful 20-acre farm and they breed um, Welsh show ponies. And one of the properties that they looked at, we looked at the house was on one side of the 20 acres and the barn was on the other side of the 20 acres right by the road. And if you think about it, they're breeding horses, right? So they're going to have full watch. And it was really hard to set up cameras, to be back and forth to the barn constantly. With the way that that property was laid out, it had big hills in the middle. So even getting like a Wi-Fi signal over there to be able to put up the cameras for full watch, it was gonna be really difficult. So looking at the proximity of the house to the barn, looking at the proximity of the barn to turn out, is there water and electric run out to the pastures? Right? So again, think about when you're looking at these properties, how am I going to get water to the horses in February? Right? Hose is going to be frozen. Probably not going to be able to keep the water tubs unfrozen without going out there and, you know, chipping a hole in them. So that's the time of year that you're going to want to think through, okay, do I need to do some trenching? Am I going to run wires? Okay? And what's the cost of that going to be? Okay? So we want to look at the layout of the property and we want to also consider the use of the property. All right, this is a question I get often asked. Do I know any good farm lenders? Okay, your agent should be able to connect you with somebody who understands how to finance a horse farm. Now, if you're buying five acres with a house and a three stall barn in, you know, you're planning to just have your own horses there, you can probably get that financed with a traditional residential mortgage. If you're thinking you're gonna buy 30 acres with a 20 stall barn and an indoor, and it has a house, but you're gonna run a boarding and training facility there, and maybe it's already set up as a boarding and training facility, now we're talking about a commercial loan, okay? And that's where it's really important to understand the difference because it's very property specific. If you're planning to use the income from that farm, right, the money that you get in from training or teaching lessons or boarding horses to pay your mortgage, and you're not planning to have it like another salary to qualify for that mortgage, we're also talking about a commercial loan. And it's important to know the difference because right now on the residential mortgage side, we're looking at rates at like three and a half, maybe 4%, and they're going up, right? The Fed has said um, they're gonna increase the rate three times this year. So right now the rates are still pretty historically low. That's with, you know, maybe 5%, 10% down over 30 years fixed, okay, your rate's not going to adjust. If you're looking at a commercial loan, and I actually spoke with Farm Credit yesterday, one of their um, lenders was here walking around. Their program is very different, okay, it's great, they offer great programs, but they're looking at, for an equestrian property, 20 years as the term, their interest rates right now are 6.5%, and they're going to require 20% down, okay, so we need to make sure when you start your search and when you're looking at farms, one of the first steps that you should do is determine what kind of property, right, it goes back to the wish list, what kind of property, and that will help dictate what kind of financing. You need to be pre-approved, okay? And that's not just, you know, because realtors are annoying and we only like to take people around that are pre-approved. It's really important that if we find the dream farm and you say, Melissa, this is the one, I wanna make an offer, that we're ready, okay? Because getting pre-approved for a residential mortgage probably do it in a day, 
okay? Most of the lenders I work with are excellent and they can do it very quickly. If you're looking at a commercial loan though and you're looking at a business to support it, you know, Farm Credit's probably gonna wanna see a business plan. They might wanna see profit and loss statements, okay? If you're currently running a business, let's say you're maybe you're renting a barn and offering training and boarding, or maybe you run a nonprofit and you're rescuing horses and receiving donations. They're gonna to wanna to see all of that and it's not gonna be a super fast process to get pre-approved. And in that interim, we don't want somebody else to come in and make an offer because they were ready. A Couple of things to do to get ready for your pre-approval. Let's say you're thinking, all right, this is all really well and good, Melissa, but I'm not buying a farm this year, I'm gonna buy one next year. There's a few things you should be doing now to get ready for your pre-approval. The first thing is file your taxes. I know that seems really obvious. Here's why. The income that you report on your tax return is the income they're probably gonna look at for your pre-approval. So if you're teaching or boarding horses, or maybe you have another line of work where you're self-employed and folks pay you in cash, I know that sounds really great, right? Everybody likes cash. Here's the problem, if you don't tell um, Uncle Sam, if you don't report that on your taxes, it can be very hard for your lender to use that as your income. So if your you know, real income is like 75,000 a year, make sure you report that on your taxes. We want you to be able to qualify based on what you really earn, not just what you um, put in the bank, if that makes sense. <coughs> know your credit, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was no? just gonna ask, you had mentioned about being pre-approved, but in the case of what if you don't wanna buy till next year, so do you <laughs> still suggest pre-approving now even, or because or, obviously the pre-approval letter won't, Right. So I don't know if everybody can hear. Um, we had a very good question in the front, and she wanted to know if you're buying next year, should you get pre approved now? No. Okay? There's no reason to get pre approved right now if you're not buying till next year. Most pre approval letters are good for like 30, 60, 90 days, I think is the longest I've ever seen. So they're going to need to have you reapply if you're going to be financing your loan next year. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't still talk to the lender. You can say, look, I'm buying next year here's my income, here's what I think my credit score is, can you talk to me about loan programs, right? Because there are programs out there for veterans, right, if you've served. There's programs out there through um, USDA that offer very low down payment programs. Um, you know, so you wanna know your options. And especially if you're thinking it's going to be a large commercial property, I would start the conversation sooner. So that when you're ready next year, you have all your documents together, you have your you know, W-2, you have your tax returns, you know your credit, okay? You can talk to them about your credit ahead of time. You wanna think about, um, as far as your credit goes, Farm Credit told me yesterday, you need a minimum of a 675, okay? For a lot of the government-backed residential loan programs, you're gonna need a minimum of a 620. Sometimes there are some exceptions there, but that's the general rule of thumb. So if you're thinking you're gonna buy next year, make sure you pay attention to that, right? Don't miss any payments. Don't do anything that's gonna affect your credit in a negative way. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of my spiel on financing. Let's talk about making an offer. So the last two years, if you've been following real estate at all, have been wild, right? We have very low inventory right now, especially with farms. Farm inventory is always a little bit less than traditional residential inventory. We've had, I would say, 15, 20% of what we traditionally have in terms of farm inventory on the market right now. And we still have a large pool of buyers that are looking for farms. So that's creating this crazy frenzy where you're seeing, even in residential homes for sure, but it's happening in farms as well, where we're getting multiple offers, prices are getting bid up, okay? This is where it's really important to have a good agent, okay? Because sometimes, sure, it's the highest offer that wins the bidding war, but sometimes it's the offer that's more creative, okay? And having an agent who can take the time to understand what the seller's needs are by talking to the other agent is really important. Now, there are things in your offer, especially in Maryland, that you're gonna wanna keep in mind, true for Pennsylvania as well. If a property is agricultural, right? If it's currently a farm, and it's currently being taxed as an agricultural property, you wanna make sure that your title company helps you do something called an agricultural declaration of intent. It's in the contract, who is gonna pay the agricultural transfer taxes? That means if you buy an agricultural property and your title company doesn't help you do that, and a good agent has a good title company, I work with one that's outstanding at this, we wanna make sure that you tell the county you're gonna keep it as a farm. 
you don't want them taxing it as a residential property. Your taxes will probably go way up if that's the case. So we want to make sure that in the contract, especially for Maryland, true for Pennsylvania, it's in a different spot, that you say who's responsible for that transfer tax. Okay? So if you buy it and you don't fill out that paperwork, you're going to get to the closing table. You don't want to be hit with a 3% transfer tax because it's 3% of the purchase price. It's not a small amount of money. Okay? Some other things you want to look at in the offer, if there's equipment that transfers. Okay? This doesn't usually happen with residential homes. But with farms, it's pretty common. Okay? Is there a tractor? Is there an arena drag? Is there mowing equipment? Okay? Is there a manure spreader? Okay? A zero turn? Are there pieces of equipment, especially if they're downsizing, right? If the farm is being sold because the people are, you know, we're tired of having a big farm, we're moving south and we're buying a condo, they probably don't need the equipment. It's really important to make sure in your offer that equipment is mentioned on a separate addendum, okay? Because usually, if you're making a financed offer, the bank is not going to want that equipment as part of the loan. Even farm credit, they don't want it part of the loan. Not for the real estate. Now, you can get equipment loans, but that's separate. Okay, so you might want to make sure you include that if you're interested in it. You might also want to think about um, if you're in a multiple offer situation, who's going to pay the seller's closing costs, right? In this market, it's really uncommon for a seller to offer to pay a buyer's closing costs. But I have seen many times where a really sophisticated buyer will say, you know what, I'll pay some of your transfer taxes. Not the agricultural transfer tax. There's another tax you have to pay when you sell a house um, to the you know, county and, and the state. Um, but sometimes you can offer to pay those things. You can offer to pay your buyer's agent directly. Okay? You can even make an offer for something that seems really unusual. I had a property um, two years ago. It was being sold by an elderly lady who was very nervous about where her horses were going to go. So we included in the offer that we would make sure that they went to really good homes and I helped connect her actually with um, two different places that the horses could go. I've also seen it where sometimes animals are offered as part of the sale. You know, I had one where the barn cats conveyed. I know that seems really silly and trivial, but for some sellers that makes a difference because it gives them peace of mind. The other thing you want to make sure when you make an offer is that you include your pre-approval. Right? So have that ahead of time. You can offer a larger earnest money deposit. Sometimes that really helps. The deposit is meant to give the seller comfort that you are going to proceed with the contract according to the terms that you've agreed to, right? As long as you close, that earnest money deposit goes towards the sale. If you don't, then it becomes a question of, you know, who gets the deposit, right? Does it go to the seller because maybe you backed out at the last minute and you're outside of all your contingency periods? Or do you get to keep it because maybe you terminated, you know, day five during your inspections period. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is inspections, though. Okay, in a multiple offer situation, you might have heard some people are waiving inspections, right? I think that's really risky for a farm. Here's why. There are a lot of different types of inspections you should have done on a farm. So if you're in a multiple offer situation, maybe you consider asking for the right to make inspections but you're going to waive maybe asking for repairs. This way you still have the option of knowing what's wrong, what might need to be fixed, and you have the option of then turning around and saying, you know what, we can handle these repairs, that's fine, we'll budget for it, or gee whiz, we did not know the foundation in this house was a mess and we're not going to proceed. But the inspections that you should ask for on a farm, I'll tell you what they are. First, of course, a home inspection. Absolutely, right? Get a good home inspector, your agent should have a list of really good home inspectors. Make sure that your home inspector will also inspect the barn, okay? So we talked about some things to look for when you're there touring the property and looking at the barn, but a good home inspector shouldn't charge you any extra to walk into that barn and tell you, is there a plumbing issue? Is there an electrical issue? Do we see signs of wood rot that could affect the structural integrity of the barn that you're gonna keep your animals in? Does the roof look like it's leaking? Is there termite damage? Okay, are there other concerns that I haven't mentioned? You know, if there's automatic waterers, do they work properly? Is there a hot water heater? Maybe there's a hot wash stall. Does that look like it's in good shape or is it leaking or rusting? Okay, you want to make sure your barn is inspected. The other two types of inspections that probably are going to be important for your farm, many or most, I should say, farms are on wells. 
okay? And if you live in the city or you live in the suburbs and you're on public water, you don't really have to worry about it, right? Um, wells are different. You're responsible for maintaining your own well. So there are two types of well inspections you're gonna to wanna to ask for. The first, you wanna yield test, okay? You wanna make sure that well is producing at least one gallon per minute, all right? And sometimes in a big farm, you'll have more than one well. You might have one for the house, maybe there's one on the other side for the barn. You wanna make sure both wells are producing enough water to support the number of animals and the number of people who are gonna be there. The other is your septic inspection, okay? Many farms are on septic systems, especially if it's an older farm and they can't tell you when it was last pumped. Definitely you want a septic inspection, okay? You want a camera inspection. You want one that's gonna, their inspector's gonna come out and they're gonna send a camera down there. They're gonna look at the tank, okay? They're gonna look at the pipes. They're gonna look at the distribution box, the drain fields. And you wanna make sure that you look at how many bedrooms does the house currently have. This is how septic systems are designed. They're designed based around bedroom size because that correlates to the number of people who are gonna be in the house, okay? And I've seen this before where folks have like a five or six bedroom house, but the septic is only meant for four bedrooms. Okay, it doesn't mean you don't proceed necessarily, but it might mean that you have to add an additional drain field, okay, if you plan to have all five or six of those bedrooms fully occupied, all right? And we wanna make sure that the septic is in good shape because that can be a really expensive repair, all right? A new septic system can be $12,000, $20,000, and that's, you know, also something that can really delay closing. Some lenders will not let you proceed with the sale if the septic is failing. All right, so we need to know that ahead of time. All right, so you found the farm, you wrote the offer, you're under contract, you did your inspections. What now? Make sure while all this is going on that you're in very close contact with your lender. They're gonna be sending you a list of required documents. They're gonna be asking you all kinds of questions. They're gonna be asking you for documents last minute sometimes. You're gonna to need to make sure that your financing is in place by the end of your financing contingency, right? So I've said contingency um, for inspections. You'll have a number of days that you can do your inspections and ask for any repairs if you're requesting them. You're also gonna have a set number of days to get your financing approved, okay? And part of that's gonna be ordering your appraisal, all right? So tell your lender to order your appraisal at the beginning of the contracting period. Some folks like to wait until the end of inspections. Talk to your agent about that. I think that's okay as long as it's only a few days. Just know that you're also gonna have in there in your offer, if it's financed, what happens if it under appraises? Now, farm appraisals are very complicated because it's not like a neighborhood home where there's five others that look just like it that sold two weeks ago. Farms are all very unique. So it's important to ask your agent, is a realtor gonna be there to meet the appraiser? Even if you're the buyer, right? You want somebody there who understands farms to walk the appraiser around. Here's why. It used to be that the bank could pick up the phone and call their favorite appraiser and send them out there to do an appraisal on the farm, right? Well, in 2008, they said you can't do that anymore, okay? So now, to get an appraisal done, if you're working with a traditional residential lender, they're gonna go through a third party, they're gonna order the appraisal through a third party. That third party is gonna say, I need an appraisal for you know, this farm over there, and they're gonna get a couple of appraisers to bid on it, and then they might choose the lowest bidder. What if they don't know anything about farms, right? So you want somebody to be there who can explain the value of the barn and the fencing and the house. So we wanna make sure that it appraises for fair market value, right? Now, if it's a multiple bid situation, you might be tempted and you might need to make an offer that's a little bit above where you and your agent think it's gonna appraise. This is very common. Then you might need to consider offering to bring additional cash. Okay, so let's say you offer to buy a farm for 500,000 and it only appraises for 475. There's a couple of options. If it's multiple offers, it's very common though that one of those other offers is gonna say, you know what? If it appraises at 475, I'll bring the other 25,000 with me to the closing table in cash. We'll still close at 500, okay? So doesn't mean you have to do that, but it's really important to understand that is gonna be probably the third hurdle to overcome as part of your contracting process, right? First thing will be inspections, okay? Does anything need to be fixed? Anything that's in disrepair that you can't really overcome? The next is gonna be your financing, okay? And the appraisal is part of the financing. But once you've gotten all your documents in and you've answered all the lender's questions, that's the part that we don't have total control over, 
right? But it's important to have a really good equestrian agent to go to that appraisal. I've seen appraisers walk out and think that a barn, a six stall barn, was just a shed and it only cost $20,000, right? And that's all they valued it at. So you make sure that you have an agent out there who understands the true cost and the value of the barn in the arena. Um, can I talk? I have one other part that I want to mention that's really important, um, and that's final walkthrough. Okay, that's the last, very, very last step before you go to closing. And that's when you go to the property, usually the morning of or the day before, you're going to want to walk through with your realtor and make sure that everything is as it should be. Did you ask the seller to make any repairs? Did they make them? Did they remove all of their personal items, any trash, any equipment that wasn't supposed to sell with the farm? Okay, make sure it's all cleaned out. In Maryland, the contract says the property has to be conveyed free and clear of trash and debris, and it has to be broom swept, okay? It's the same in Pennsylvania. They don't have to deep clean the house. I know that sounds unfortunate, but make sure that everything is removed that should be removed, okay? Also, make sure they didn't remove anything they weren't supposed to, okay? I've seen sellers try to do that, where maybe they thought, well, we're going to take the fridge with us. No, 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 the fridge, it says in the contract what is supposed to convey. If it's permanently attached to the property, they're not supposed to remove it unless you have it in the contract that they're allowed to remove it, okay? And make sure they didn't do any new damage to it, right? Things happen sometimes, you know, but if when you went out there and did your inspection and there wasn't a huge hole in the living room or there wasn't an issue in the barn and nothing was flooded, make sure there's no damage. Um, I had one two years ago. We went out there the day of closing. This was a residential sale and the house was vacant. Nobody was living in it. Um, and we got there for the final walkthrough. There was a huge tree branch that had fallen on the house and it punctured holes in the roof, through the sheathing in the roof. Okay, you could see it through the, you know, in the attic. Now, fortunately, the owners of that house had really good homeowner's insurance still on it, okay? And she was very reasonable. She called her homeowners. We got a roofer out there that day and she agreed to have, you know, the roofing company fix it. Homeowners paid for it. We were able to close later that afternoon. Unfortunately, if we had gone to closing, and not seen that issue, once you've bought it, it's yours, okay? There's no real recourse in that situation. So make sure you do final walkthrough with your agent, check the barn, check the house, check the pastures, make sure everything is good before you go to closing and sign, okay? Um, so that's my talk. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, I'm gonna come back there so we can hear you. Was that, was that your book that I was talking to about a property that doesn't have a home on it? Mm -hmm. um, so how does the process vary if you're buying a property that doesn't have a home that you want? Okay, so we got a really good question about buying a property that is land but doesn't have a home on it. So there's two options. If you're looking at buying land and then building a house, building a barn, the first is you can certainly um, buy the land and hold it. If you're looking at using a loan, uh, land loans are going to probably require 30% down. Okay, they're gonna be a little more expensive. You're probably gonna to have to go through an agricultural lender if you're just buying land and you're not tying it to a construction loan. The second part of it, though, is you can, the second option, I should say, is you can buy land and tie it immediately to a construction loan. That's gonna be more of a residential loan product, usually. Now, one thing that's really important to keep in mind when you're buying land, you wanna make sure that your agent and you check with the county on zoning, right? Can it be a farm? Are you, how many houses can you build on it? It's very common for farmland to also be in agricultural preservation. That will limit how many houses you can build on it, right? So if they've subdivided it off, can you build a house on that part? Um, the other part that's really important when you're looking at land is it has to pass, if you're planning to build a house on it, has to pass a perk test, okay? And that's a test to make sure that the soil drains at the correct rate to accommodate a septic system. Okay, if it doesn't pass a perk test, that might mean you can't build a house on it. Now you've bought land that you can't live on. Okay, um, make sure that if you make an offer on that land that it includes a contingency for you, the buyer, to be allowed to have a septic test or a perk test performed. Okay, now there's different kinds of septic systems um, and that'll also impact the cost of the septic. The other part of buying land that's really important, you might wanna consider, does it have a well, right? How are you gonna get water? Having a well drilled, sometimes you can ask the seller to do it, but again, if it's a competitive situation where there's other offers, you might be on the hook for putting in the well. Sometimes you can include that as a contingency, right? That you have the option before closing to drill a well, and if for some reason you can't get a well there, 
you have the option to terminate, but you want to know that before you buy it, right? So make sure that the well and septic are addressed in the offer that you make. Make sure you check zoning. Make sure you ask if there's any deed restrictions on the property. I've seen farms for sale where you're not allowed to have chickens on them. I've seen some for sale where, you know, you can only have so many horses, okay? Or maybe they've limited how many houses that you can put on it. Or you have to get permission from all the other landowners that own the other parcels in that initial subdivision for what you want to do with it. The other part, and that's, and I'll, this is the, the end of the land question, how do you access the land? I have seen some parcels that are really cheap because when you get there, you realize the topography, it's really a steep uphill climb. Remember, if there's no driveway there, you're going to have to have a way to access your land, right? So you want to make sure, one, can you access the land? Do you have to drive through and get permission from a neighbor? Is that included in the deed? How are you getting back to your land if it's landlocked? Um, and then is there going to be an expensive process for putting in a driveway? Okay, and you're going to need to factor that in as part of the cost of building. Um, the last part I'll say is make sure that if you are building, you work with a really good builder. Uh, most agents, including myself, have a network of builders, barn builders, house builders. Um, you want to make sure that you have a really positive experience there. So, any other questions? Yep. Um, we are struggling with the contingency of having to sell our house to get somebody mm -hmm. else. I know it's really tough in this market. Do you have any suggestions on that? Yeah. So, we had a, a, another really good question in the front. Um, they're looking at buying a farm and selling their house, right? This is very common. We don't want you to sell your house and then be homeless, right? So how do you tie those together? There's a couple of ways. Um, the first, of course, is to sell your house and then buy the farm. The problem with that is what if you don't find a farm that you really like? Or what if you find one that you like but there's five offers on it and you don't win the bidding war? Okay, so my advice to my clients who have a house to sell or a farm out to sell and they're looking for something else, first thing to do is get your house ready, right? Meet with an agent who could walk through and tell you, okay, here are the things to do to make sure your house is photo ready. Maybe you photograph it, right? Have your agent come in with the photographer. We at Hagen do video. Make sure they get all the materials ready to list your house and then start looking at farms, right? Now your house is still gonna be off market at this point because we don't want, if you have a house in a very desirable neighborhood that it sells in five days and now we're under some sort of pressure cooker to find you a farm to move to, right, if you don't have sort of a temporary living situation in mind. Um, I think it's important in that moment to say, you know what, we're going to look for farms. Maybe you look at five. If out of those five farms, you don't like anything that we've looked at, we're not going to put your house on the market. We're going to focus on finding farms that you're happy with. Maybe we adjust something in your search criteria. Or oftentimes, though, it's really a matter of just being patient. We have to wait for the right farm to come on the market. Now, in the meantime, we haven't put your house on the market yet again because I don't want to sell it and have somebody be homeless. But what we can do is make a contingent offer at that point and say, that house will be on the market tomorrow, right? We've already photographed it. It's already ready. I can send photos of that house to the other agent, to the listing agent. I can send them the price point that we're coming in at, okay? I can say, look, this house will be on the market tomorrow. Here is the photos. It shows really well. It's going to be listed at, I'm going to make up a number, 500,000, okay? And here's the days on market that we anticipate it'll take to sell it based on what other homes in that same community are selling for. All right? So that, that's my advice. Um, because that way you can tie the two transactions together. You can close on the sale of your house, maybe that morning, um, and your agent who is selling your house should be able to help negotiate that so that you're closing that morning on the sale of your home and that afternoon on the purchase of the farm. Now, if you're only wanting to sell your house to buy that particular farm, right? Let's say you've been looking on and off for two years. That's the only farm you like, and if that one doesn't work out, you're not selling your house, right? Back to, we don't want you to be homeless. There are ways that you can write your offer, or I'm sorry, your contract on the sale of your house so that you're protected, right? So that you can say it's kind of the opposite of a home to sell contingency, which is what she mentioned. You know, I have to sell my house to buy the farm you're gonna make a home, of a home of choice, rather, home of choice contingency, where you're saying to the buyer for your house, I'll sell you the house, but only if this other sale is gonna proceed, right? So I get my financing through for that other farm, the inspections go well, the appraisal's okay, and there's a way to put an addendum in that will protect you. 
Now, some buyers might not like that, but in the market we're in right now, there are a lot of buyers who will be accepting of that. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's okay. Does anyone have any other questions? Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, what is the difference between a pre-approval and a pre, what's the other word? Pre Qualification. And pre-qualification. Sure. Um, so the question I was just asked is, what is the difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification? That's a really good question because a lot of lenders will try to tell you that a pre-qualification is, is fine. Um, in, a, in a really competitive multiple offer situation, a pre-qualification will not win. Okay, here's why. A really smart listing agent is going to know that the pre-approval process is a little bit more detailed, a little bit more strict. They're going to run your credit and your loan, uh, your loan application, sorry, <laughs> through automated underwriting. So they're going to already have looked at your credit, your income, your existing debts. They're going to have verified, hopefully, your income is what you say it is through looking at your W-2s, your tax returns. It is a much more stringent process, but there's a much higher degree of confidence when I, as a listing agent, receive a pre-approval as opposed to a pre-qualification, okay? So make sure that when you're talking to your lender, you tell them, no, no, I want a pre-approval, not a pre-qualification, because pre-approval is much stronger. Part two. Uh -huh. Does do either of those require that you actually take out a loan? Okay, so the question I got is, do either the pre-approval or the pre-qualification require that you take out the loan? No, absolutely not. So you can get a pre-approval, you can look for you know, a property for 30, 60, 90 days. If you don't find something that you like and make an offer and go under contract, you're not required to take the loan out. Okay, and you can get pre-approved by more than one lender, and I highly recommend that, okay? You can shop the rate around. Now, I don't want you to go out and apply for a loan every you know, every day for the next three months, right? But if you're looking for, say, a 14-day period and you apply to three different lenders, see who's gonna give you the best rate, that won't impact your credit the way it would if you went out and looked for buying a truck and went to four different car dealerships and had them all pull your credit, okay? So shop around, talk to different lenders, but no, a pre-approval doesn't require that you go with that lender. When you make your offer, though, try to be sure about which lender you wanna work with because you're gonna have a limited amount of time after you go under contract to make your full loan approval um, application. So you're gonna to wanna to apply with the lender that you know you wanna work with. Any other questions about buying farms? Yep. Um, of course I just drove away. Um, Was it about financing maybe or inspections? Um, if you walk away, I'll think about it, then I'll see <laughs> <talk> you later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we, we lost the question there, but um, Anybody else have questions? Anything else about buying farms? I'm happy to talk about selling farms too, of course. <laughs> okay, well, if you have any other questions and you wanna ask me afterwards, happy to chat. Um, thank you for coming, really appreciate it, and um, good luck to you all. I hope you all find your dream farms. <laughs>